Pull up a stool and pour yourself a pint as you're about to join three intrepid drinkers, Kevin, Justin, and Mark, as they embark on another beer-tastic voyage. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Beer-tastic Voyage. My name is Kevin. I'm Mark. And I'm Justin. And today we are at the Brewers Collective, and we have a very special guest, homebrew author John Palmer, author of not one, not two, but three various books on homebrewing. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing great. Thanks really so much for taking here. some time to uh, talk with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. So, I just want to go over real quick. You've got How to Brew, Brewing right. Classic Styles, and the Comprehensive Guide to Water. Right, there. right. So yeah. you covered lots of bases on there. Well, yeah, you know, I've been at this a while. It's been uh, 20, 25 years, kind of, since I started writing. And, Once or uh, twice you've done it, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's not it's not any kind of overnight thing. It's a very slow snowball, I think. <laughs> well, as I, I know Mark has a copy of the book. I'm pretty sure Justin does also, right? Yes, I do. Of, 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 uh, and there's a ton of home food books out there, but what kind of, I know you got into it because you want to have the book that you wanted, but what really makes yours that much different from all the other ones? Well, I guess I'm, I'm a, I was a, an engineer by trade. Okay. Uh, industry at the time, later on medical devices, but um, yeah, you know, looking at the brewing process from an engineering point of view, you know, what makes this process tick? What are the critical control points? Why do you have to do these steps this way? I mean, I thought a lot of that information was missing from the early instructions, and when I say early instructions, I mean like in the early 90s, you know, okay. wasn't a whole lot to go on. The internet really wasn't around at that point. Right. You couldn't just Google it and get 1,400 yeah. hits on it and be like, oh, I can yeah. figure something out. You couldn't, you couldn't pull up YouTube and watch somebody do yeah. it. Yeah. And how to brew is that? It's uh, fourth iteration, right? Fourth, fourth iteration, yeah. Nice. Fourth edition. Right. Thank you. What would you say the, uh, the biggest change is? Well, yeah, it's been 10 years since the third edition. And um, I reworked the fermentation chapter. Sunday, and it was 
unbelievable for me the questions that I was getting. Like, oh, I asked all these questions, and I'm explaining it how I do it now. I built, right. I built my own electric system. You know, I do e starters and all this, all the things that I, you know, people who want to complicate things do. Right. And I see the person going, oh my god, I'm like, and I said the same thing. You don't have to do any of this. Like, you can, you can slowly add things. So yeah. I think that um, what I liked about the book when I read it was that it has that approach. It, it kind of builds you up, as you said from the beginning. Yeah. There's two, the more advanced things for crazy people. starting to get into it. Basically, I waited until, you know, it took me 11 years to get my bachelor's degree, but once I finally was done with that, I was like, okay, now I can start a hobby. And I think yours was the second book that I read, Okay. based upon a recommendation of another one of my friends. He was like, no, 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 you've got to get this one, because the one that I was reading wasn't written that terribly well. And then when I picked up your book and started reading it, I'm like, oh my, it, it, this makes so much more sense now, just because it's written so approachably. I mean, I writing it as a home brewer to another home brewer, you know, what do you have to do? What do you have to worry about or don't have to worry about? I mean, those are the those are kind of like my guiding principles and as I'm trying to explain this stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, brewing is cooking, really. I mean, yeah. if you can make macaroni and cheese, if you can bake some cookies, well, then you can brew. Yeah, that's what I tell people. Like, you make your own beer, I'm like, yeah, it's a cool soaking some grain in hot water for an hour and then boiling it. Yeah. And then you wait for two weeks. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can get into the science, you can get into the techniques, but at the same time, you know, you don't have to be a five-star chef to cook dinner every night. Right. No, not at all. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I love about the hobby. Is it's so approachable and so expandable at the same time. Yeah, and you can go as deep as you want to. Right, right. So my question is, thinking about this, we have a lot of listeners that are not similar. Right. I'm wondering what they could know about the brewing process or about beer in general when they're looking at the board. They could potentially figure out maybe a new style they like to drink or just sort of any general advice based on, you know, the process that can help them know beer they might like to drink. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I would say I would look at the different beer styles. I mean, your pale ales, your pale lagers, these are you know, generally base malt only. Um, they're the equivalent of a, a light sandwich, you know. Um, you got you know, the bread is the main thing. Um, you know, then, if, but if you like, you know, if you like darker bread crust or you like richer flavors, now you can move into some of the dark beers. Um, if you are the a hop head kind of person, or you know, maybe you're interested in extreme flavors and the foods you eat, um, you know, you may be more interested in IPAs, um, where you have you know uh, more more complexity and uh, stronger flavors. But uh, one thing, one thing we always hear, you know, as brewers, is that oh, you know, I don't like beer. Well, you know, have you tried every single have style that exists? Yeah, have, you, have you had anything that isn't mass market lager? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's so many different styles, and I'm sure there's a beer for everyone. Just like there's a beer for every, really every food pairing, you know. Right. Um, amber ales for you know pizza, st- um, stouts for you know uh, heartier foods. You know, roast and so on. I mean, there's there's so many different kinds, there's so much diversity of flavor that uh, yeah, you can you can find a beer that you like. Yeah, especially like once you start getting into like sour beers too, because like we we have you know a friend that's a wine drinker, and uh, you know I think it was uh, a Thanksgiving celebration. We just gave him a glass. We didn't tell him what it was. Oh, nice. I don't remember what beer it was specifically, but it was a sour beer. We're like, Glenn, drink this. And he took a sip. He was like. All right. So, as we talked about, like the different, as you mentioned, like there's different styles, and I, I love the analogy that you gave of the different kinds of food to the beers. I think that was a really straightforward way to approach it. And um, so, my question to you is, with all the different styles out there, is there anything particular that you've kind of seen starting to trend of what's coming through? Um, uh. You know, we've gone through. I don't know if we've gone through the IPA craze yet or whatever, but we've gone through <laughs> the next one. But, but there's always going to be that next one. So yeah. what do you see? You travel a lot more than the rest of us. What do you see yeah. I, coming it, through? That, that's a great question. And I really do see the same pattern worldwide. 
not just here in the United States, okay. not just in home brewing, but the craft beer industry worldwide. Um, it mirrors that of home brewers, where you have, you know, at the beginning, you always have those bad batches. You know, you're making the beginner mistakes, you know, we all did. Um, and you have those first bad beers. Then you have the good beers, where you've, you've conquered those initial mistakes. And now you're brewing some nice pale ales or some, you know, some basic beers very well. Success breeds confidence. Right. And you move on to a strong beer. And this there may be a strong IPA. This may be uh, a barley wine. Right. After you've done that, you're thinking, wow, I can ferment anything. And you move on to <laughs> spice beers and sour beers and barrel-aged beers. Right. That's kind of like the fourth stage. All right. Once you've honed your skills and are starting doing those well, now you're looking at those session beers again. Yeah, you know, that's the, exactly where I'm at now. I'm like, yeah. I want a Kolsch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want that, that small, that, that lower alcohol but vibrant flavor that you can quaff. I mean, you can really drink a lot of. And so you're brewing the Munich Hellas, the Kolsch, the Pilsner. You know, beers that actually take a lot of skill to brew because there's, you know, there's really no, no way for faults to hide. Right, and this is exactly the trend you see in in craft breweries around the world, where you, you go through these you know various IPA crazes and barrel age crazes and sour beers, and then you see them start coming back to some of the classic styles. Interesting. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with the you know the strong beers and the sour beers and so on. Right. But in terms of brewing skill. Uh, you're much better able to produce these smaller styles right. uh, once you have experience, you know, in controlling fermentation and controlling off flavors and and so on. Um, yeah, uh, so the, I mean, you will see those trends, and I think uh, a lot of craft beer breweries also realize after a while that hey, you know, these uh, these session beers aren't as expensive to make either. I mean, you know, not right. using... Yeah, that, that's always a good thing. If you can keep the overhead down, yeah. that's great. Yeah, <laughs> but, so, uh, yeah. No, I think that's really interesting that you... To point that exact out, because I feel like we've done that exact cycle here on the show, too, of what beers we want to drink and what we're going through and how many times in the past couple of week sessions that we've gone through have we been saying, like, yeah. man, a really well done, quote-unquote, simple beer has been fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, you think you know, once, you, once you have all the extremes, it, uh, it sort of, you're right, it brings itself back around to, like, okay, I'm really tired. I would like yeah. to just have the, like a call shirt. You can appreciate the simplicity. Yeah. An oatmeal yeah. stout, just something. I don't need an oatmeal stout with five yeah. things in it. I need just the oatmeal stout. Right. And it doesn't need to be high alcohol. I want 5%, and that's good enough. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So in that cycle, where are you for your home brewing? What are oh, you? What are you make when you get a chance to brew an own batch for you at home? What are you making? I'm yeah, you know, I will occasionally brew like a barley wine. You know, if it's in the fall or something, okay. I'm thinking I want, I do want something you know that I sip at Christmas time. Um, other times of the year, it's maybe a New England IPA. You know, right. um, again around a four or five percent kind of beer. Uh-huh. Um, I, I do like Vienna Lager, uh, Munich Dunkel. Nice. I, I brew a lot of those, uh, especially, well, collaboration brews. I tend to do those a lot. Well, that's, yeah. what, we're, that's what we're doing today at the Brewery yeah. Collective, right? Ba- like a, basically a riff on a Vienna Lager? Right, yeah. right. Yeah, kind of the the uh, the Mexico style, the Negro Modelo kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Where, super, yeah. yeah. It's cool. I just brewed one of those, and I put tequila-soaked oak in it oh, for an upcoming yeah, festival. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah, I mean, there's so much you can do with these base beer styles, and just just to tweak them, you know, and make them a little to your taste. But yeah, that's that's what I tend to brew. All right, awesome. Yeah, we um, these guys have been really making a variety of stuff. You guys have been going off, and I know they have a uh, what they call their white whale beers. Oh yeah, you know, like Mark <laughs> is really always trying to hammer down a great Kolsch, and Justin's been trying to hammer down a a great oatmeal. Is there one that you've been chasing after for a while that you've said, like, man, I know I, I like it. I know I got a pretty good one, but I wish I could just make it a little bit better. Uh, you know, um, I'm really not brewing that often, to, yeah. to be honest. I mean, gotcha. I do so many. I do every other week is basically travel for me. Right. Going man. somewhere. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm brewing once or twice a year, and it's usually... Uh, different styles every time. Yeah. So. Yeah. You plus that far apart, you're like, I just want to do something different, something I didn't just collaborate on like, yeah, three days yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I mean, you know, different times of the year when I get around to brewing, it's like, you know, what do I really feel like drinking now? 
and it's often changing with the seasons. So yeah. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I, I understand the question. I mean, you know, what are we trying to chase down? And often, uh, I would say the answer to that is malt and hop balance. Okay. Um, as home brewers, we tend to to over hop and dry hop everything, and whirlpool hop every every style. Right. And um, I was doing some mash pH experiments uh, a couple years ago and uh, wanted to use a porter recipe just because it would give me a good cross-section of different malts in the mash and, and okay. the, res- the pH sense. response with residual alkalinity of, the, of those mashes. So I was using this one porter recipe and, and tasting the wort, it made me realize what a wonderful malt balance this wort had and that if I were to you know, add flavor addition hops 30, you know, 15 minutes and so on, that I would tend to cloud up that malt character okay. with hop character. And it's like, you know, I'm just going to do a bittering addition only. Okay. And then maybe, then I, of course, in the, in the actual brewing process, I weaken and I throw some hops in at the end. <laughs> yeah. But just for right. a little bit of aroma. But, I mean, yeah, really focusing on bringing out the malt character. Um, with the malts we have, the variety of malts we have today is so nice. Yeah, um, and, and, and that's a very good point. Like, so much of American Craft Brewers focuses on the hops and not on the yeah. malt itself. Right. And at, for me and Justin and Kevin, really, too, like, we're, we're more, about, more about the malt flavors than the yeah. hop flavors. Yeah. We had one of uh, our club members, Brian, who went out to NHC, and while he was out there, he got to taste a bunch of uh, craft malt beer, uh, craft malts from, like, Mecca Grade, Hudson oh, Valley, yeah. which is out here. And he brought them to a thing we were at, and it was amazing to taste. It was all two row. Yeah. And to taste the different like levels of sweetness and levels of like breadiness from just from the malts themselves, it, right. it was you know you kind of go to a uh, homebrew shop and you're like, well, I just need two row. And it made me understand more why when I read a, a recipe, a lot of times it's a specific. Oh well, I specify the malts there. Yeah. And, and yeah. Everything, and especially for base malts, I didn't think it would make that much of a difference. I mean, obviously you have uh, specific things like a uh, midnight wheat or a chocolate rye from specific manufacturers. Right. But everybody makes a two row and they're all pretty different so it's interesting you can kind of find your own that works best in whatever style you want yeah oh yeah i mean barley variety is becoming more important these days uh we are getting back into um bre- you know breeding malt varieties for flavor right and looking and not for just that diastatic not, power yeah not just diastatic power not just agronomy uh, which is of course very important to the farmer but um Barca Pills from Wireman is a very good example of that. Where I mean, to taste that malt, right. you know, just out of the bin, it just amazed at the at the amount of malt flavor in that malt. Um, it's incredible. Um, then and you know, Brees and other malt and other right. malting companies are are doing the same thing. Yeah, bringing back some or and breeding for uh, more barley flavor, more malt flavor in in today's varieties. Yeah, I think going back and reconsidering those heritage varieties at exactly, the local universities. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, taking taking like something like Chevalier and then crossbreeding with a more, you know, agronomic uh, malt from today and, you know, trying to get back those flavor characteristics of yesteryear. It's funny you should bring up that particular malt because LIBME did a collaboration with Long Ireland out in Riverhead. Uh, we, did mm-hmm. a, they did, we did a Maibach. And we were we saw that a bag of that Chevalier, and I, I ran over and grabbed some. We were all like eating it. It was like candy. Yeah, we literally yeah. just eat it. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I need to find this. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so you're originally from the Midwest, right? Yep. And now you live out in California, right? So, but you travel extensively, as you mentioned. What are you seeing, kind of regionally? Are you seeing like certain themes appearing regionally as far as beer styles that are being created, or does it kind of go back to that same cycle? Like everybody's on that cycle in their own way, or what? What are some thoughts that you just have on yeah. regional beers in general? Well, you know, uh, I guess with a small amount of pride, I do say that the the rest of the world is tending to follow the United States. Sure, I'm sorry, and uh, so the. A lot. I mean, if you look at craft brewing in Europe or South America right. or East, a lot of people are following the United States trends. You know, they're going for the American IPA, the hazy New England IPA. I mean, oh yeah, I was just recently down in Brazil, and everybody's brewing hazy IPAs down there too. Interesting. So, 
but at the same same time I'm telling them it's like they're they're asking me you know what can we do to improve our beers and it's like well you know I would focus on the fruits that you have in South America I mean these are flavors yeah. that yeah. we don't have in, in North America um, you can brew unique beers that we don't have and uh, and you'll do well and I think um, so you know here in the states, New England IPAs come up. Brood IPA just recently uh, reared its head. I don't know how long that one will stick around, but it'd be interesting to see. Yeah. Um, then, you know, who knows what's next on the horizon? I mean, there's so many breweries out yeah. in the United States. Somebody's going to c- come up with something sooner or later. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think in the you know, elsewhere in the world, we're going to start seeing some interesting fruit beers, sour beers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. Uh, South Africa has so really? many native herbs and woods um, that you know produce some very interesting flavors. I think they're, we're going to start seeing more of those on the scene. Um, yeah, just that's cool. Lots of possibilities. Yeah, I like thought of that. I just listened to a, a basic brewing podcast, and they did. Uh, they were talking to Cascade Brewing, and they were they did a, a oh, yeah. sour beer with pawpaws, which are, I mean I didn't know what they were. I had to look it up, but it was apparently it's a Midwestern like fruit basically. No, it's no, not, no. Yeah, they, there's tons of pawpaws around like DC. Oh, really? Even over here? Okay. I, yeah. just, I knew they couldn't get them up there, and they worked with a brewery, I believe, in Ohio or Indiana to get them. So that's, I figured it was Midwestern. But pawpaws, was, not prickly pears. Did, no, not prickly pears. <laughs> Next time, beware. Yes, and sorry. It's funny, I had it's, funny that, it's funny that you made that reference because the same reference was made on the, on the Basic Brewery podcast. It's funny. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's exactly what comes to mind when you hear about that. I you, can't help myself. You talked about Malton in South America, and um, Mark and I made a Russian Imperial Stout. Actually, oddly enough, we have a bottle of it here today. Nice. With uh, we used Patagonia malt, some Patagonia malt, it was oh, like yeah. a crystal, a very high crystal, the one ninety, and it was it, it was a very different. Like you, you think of that zone, it's almost in the danger zone of malting, right? And it was, it actually added a really nice, like, burnt caramel sweetness to it. And uh, it, it goes to show, like you said, the regionality of that particular malt. Because I think there's got to be a reason why nobody else is doing a malt that style. Right, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, unfortunately, so many craft breweries try to imitate the classic styles. And in terms of a, a, a functioning brewery or a uh, you know that can be difficult given, you know the the industrial beer in every country. You know the the the, right. the, the log the you know pale lagers. It's hard to compete, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Um, whereas you know they, if you explore some more niche styles, um, some more innovative styles, now okay. you know the brewery can, you know, uh, have something unique that the locals will come to. And I think, I think the whole idea, the whole concept of you know. Buy local, you know, uh, local beer. Um, I think is a, is a very necessary one um, because not only to support the brewery, but also to to get more of these uh, broadening of our of tastes in, in beer. I mean, yeah. traditionally, that's how it happened, right? That's why yeah. we have these regional, these what we now call classic styles, but they right. were actually at the time regional, right? Exactly. Yeah, they were the regional styles of yesteryear. Yeah, interesting. They, they made that kind of beer because that's what worked with what they had. Right, yeah. exactly. They yeah. didn't have access to uh, everything under the sun the way that we do. Yeah. Or, they, you know, their water was really hard or really soft and, yeah. you know, or there was a lo- beers you know, worked better for this and later beers worked better for that. Yeah. Rye would be a local grain and that's yeah. what they had to brew with. You know. or my, I love my, rye. My, fa- my favorite reoccurring theme is how can we avoid the tax man? So let's oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> if we brew it this way, we won't get taxed. So let's do it this way. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. it becomes classic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, so, can you uh, talk a little bit about the recipe that you put together today? Well, I'm oh, right. Brewing, and for, you know, we haven't mentioned it. We're brewing at the Brewers Collective with a collaboration brew with all the the homebrew clubs that we affectionately know as Aslick. Yeah. <laughs> so we had we had a variety of malts available to us uh, from here at the Brewers Collective. Um, a lot of uh, New New York malts. Um, so we had, but we also had you know a variety of. Uh, uh, I guess more more common commercial malts. We had some Vienna, and of course, since you asked me what I would like to brew, I said, "Well, I like to brew a Vienna." So, uh, <laughs> but it's a darker one. It's it's more similar to the uh, oh, the Mexican dark lagers, the Negro Modelo, the Dos Equis Amber. Right. What I tend to call an East LA lager because that's a lot of what uh, okay I associate you know the LA area with. Um, yeah, so it's um, about a 20 SRM color, 
Uh, we used 50% Vienna malt, 30% uh, New York pale ale malt, then 10% Crystal 10, 5% uh, Melanoidin, and 5% uh, Midnight Wheat. Now, right. the Midnight Wheat, we added halfway through the mash um, just to, to get you know some decent color extraction from the wheat but not and not bring that uh, mash pH too low uh, okay. water here in New York is pretty soft not a lot of alkalinity buffering it so um, yeah I kind of wanted to hold off adding the dark grain till about halfway through make sure we had really good, good yeah good conversion before we added okay. it our p- mash pHs came in at 535 or sorry, five four five initially, and five three five after we added the dark grain. Right, so. right, right in the sweet spot. Yeah, there you really. go. Um, do you guys have any other question, specific questions that you wanted to ask John, or should we uh, hit him with a six pack of questions? Oh, and no, we also used Amarillo else. hops. Forgot about that. Okay. Yeah, I saw a big bag of Idaho Seven sitting out. I wasn't sure if that got those. Today. Yeah, no, I don't nah, think not either. today. <laughs> yeah. Just no, I'm going gonna, gonna to throw that in the truck of Mark's car before we leave. There you <laughs> go. So, John, we like to ask all of our guests uh, our six-pack of questions. Oh, okay. And uh, I've, So, I, you kind of touched on number one already, which is, uh, what's your favorite beer or old standby that you always like having around? Um, well, my, my favorite beer to have in the fridge, that would probably be a, uh, an IPA, West Coast IPA. Nice. And uh, so this is more applicable to the brewers that we uh, interview, which is, what's your favorite brewery that isn't your own? But, huh? Um, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I gotta, I gotta plug my local Eagle Rock. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Eagle number, Rock Brewery. Number three is, uh, what is your favorite brewing ingredient? Ah, malt. Yeah, yeah. Just generally malt. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. There um, you go. Hey, you know, uh, Breeze dark chocolate. Oh, oh specifically, there we go. I like yeah, that. I like Breeze okay. dark chocolate. And what? And I mean, what style? Um, obviously, a darker style. But would you pick that for a roastier stout or something like a smoother porter? Um, porters. Yeah, I, I do like porter a lot. Um, but even you know, brown ales, you know, stouts. I find that the the dark chocolate has a cleaner flavor, a more cocoa flavor than the regular chocolate malts. Okay. Um, and as you go lower into, say, pale chocolate, I feel like you get too much of that that very dry brown ale kind of character or, you know, um, kind of a har- really a harshness in terms of thing. But when you get up in the 400 lower bond with the dark chocolate, I feel it's a very nice, clean uh, cocoa flavor that I like. I'll have to check that out. That's cool. It's a good answer. That's the best answer we've got on that question, yes. to be honest. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely the most direct. <laughs> usually, usually people are like, oh, my God, I have to choose. <laughs> so uh, number four is what is your least favorite style of beer? Rogan beer. Wow. Interesting. That would literally be one of Marcus. <laughs> yeah, top I, four. I, you know, I'm old school. Yeah. Um, I you know, started <laughs> brewing in the early 90s, and you had so much bad homebrew back then. Um, that was due to fermentation flaws. So strong phenolics due to you know wrong fermentation temp. Okay. Just really turned me off to phenolics. Um, other, yeah. So I don't like phenols, even though I can I can judge German beers, right. you know, uh, with the, and Belgian beers, but I really just don't care for them. That makes That's sense. Fair. Yeah, that makes total sense. Absolutely. Number so number number five is uh, well, I mean, you've probably been there, Ray. But number five is where do you want to go on beercation? Ah, again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would like to go back to Belgium. Um, well, I'd like to go back to Germany for, too, for that matter. And I haven't been to the Czech Republic yet. So yeah, okay. there's there's a little pocket <laughs> there. I'd get, like get to some get some Bohemian pilsners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah why not? Yeah. All right, and so no, uh, the last one here is uh, what's the favorite name that you've encountered for a beer, whether it's punny or oh. you know apropos. Um. This is always the hardest question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's like the 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 ones I've liked have been like old uh, noggin fogger, um, <laughs> kind of barley wine kind of names. Oh yeah, those are those are some of our favorites too. Yeah, yeah. nice. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of the busy brew oh, day to chat pleasure. with us and to just share your wisdom. It's been a huge uh, honor to have you on the show. Oh, yeah, well, is there, is there uh, anything coming up you want people to know about other than, obviously, your, the new uh, fourth edition of your book? Yeah, uh, no, that's about it. I mean, I'm going to be traveling, and I guess in a couple weeks I'm headed down to uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, doing the same kind of thing there, okay. visiting some clubs, visiting some breweries. After that, I head off to Quebec, Canada. Oh, wow. All right. Do the same thing there. Um, yeah, just sure. enjoying it. Excellent. That's really it's always, cool. always good talking to beer people. Yeah. Absolutely. So, well, thank uh, you very much. I would say just last thing, where, uh, where can they find you? Uh, we got a website, ha- oh. user handles, anything like that, that where people can find you? Or you want to just send uh, yeah. it to us and we'll link look it? At, look at it. Uh, I think it's at How to Brew um, or Palmer or something like that on uh, Twitter, maybe Instagram. I'm not much of a social media person. Okay. Um, I, I just don't consider myself that interesting, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> well, we'll have all those links in the show notes. And okay. once again, thank you so much. Cool. Thanks, thanks thank you. Thank Cheers, you. man. Have a great day. If you enjoyed Beertastic Voyage, please be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to review and rate us. The guys can be found online at www.beertasticvoyage.com on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Beertastic Voyage, and Twitter and Instagram at Beertastic Show, or send them a good old-fashioned email at beertasticvoyage at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and cheers for local beers.